Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about how to navigate the risks and opportunities that currently present themselves in the share market. I think navigating the share market over the next few years might prove a little challenging, primarily because markets haven't really adapted to higher interest rates yet. And But whilst I think there's some significant risk to avoid, I also believe there's some promising opportunities to consider, which is exactly what I wanted to talk about today. Now, just as a bit of a recap, to successfully invest in the stock market, I think you really need to follow three essential steps. The first step is to identify the markets, geographical markets, that exhibit the strongest potential for delivering above average returns over the next five to 10 years based on their fundamentals. That is, which markets are relatively cheap by historical standards. Secondly, use investment products and methodologies that are low cost and that use evidence-based investment methodologies to access these markets, such as index funds. And finally, have the patience and discipline to hold these investments for potentially many decades to allow mean reversion to do all the heavy lifting for you, that is to deliver really strong investment returns. Now, I should mention or highlight that it's important to note that this three-pronged approach doesn't require you to predict future trends or select individual stocks or engage in frequent buying and selling, so stock trading. Uh, In fact, these uh, actions have proven to be ineffective and costly. Instead, you can certainly enhance your portfolio's performance and reduce its investment risk just by focusing on where, so which geographical markets, and how, which investment methodologies and products uh, you use to invest. Now, one of the things I like to think about when considering where to invest is to look at past performance, because the irrefutable law of mean reversion dictates that markets which have shown above average returns over the past decade are likely to yield below average returns over the next decade, as returns tend to revert to their long-term averages over time. Therefore, when considering where to invest capital in share markets, it's often prudent to invest less in markets or asset classes that have outperformed over the recent decade. Now, I should point out I said less, not nothing at all, because that would be too aggressive from an asset allocation perspective. So what I've done is I've had a look at asset class returns over the last year, three years, five years, and 10 years. And of course, you'll find the Um, chart on the website in the blog and the link is in the show notes. Uh, It's noteworthy that bonds, real estate, emerging markets, the UK market, and to a lesser extent, the Australian market have all provided returns below the long-term average over the past decade. In contrast, the US market and the global index have outperformed during this period, and perhaps that will give you some hints to maybe where you should be investing in the future. Now, if we dig a little deeper under the hood of this under and out performance, we start to see really where the risk and opportunity is. So compared to historic levels, the stock market valuations in the US remain notably high. The US CAPE ratio, and the CAPE ratio is an acronym that stands for Cyclically Adjusted PE Ratio, It's a valuation metric that smooths out any fluctuations in company earnings. Anyway, the US CAPE ratio stands at almost 30 times, which significantly exceeds the long-term average of only 17 times. So it shows how overcooked valuations are in the US stock market. And this suggests that perhaps the US stock market has in fact in the possibility of a recession presumably because it anticipates that the central bank will start cutting interest rates in the coming months. However, if you look at the bond market, the bond market has a completely different view. The US yield curve is sloping down a little bit, suggesting that interest rates might be cut by half a percent over the next five years, but then interest rates tick up again. In Australia, it's completely different. The Australian bond yield curve is sloping upwards, which suggests that interest rates won't change for the next five years and might be higher thereafter. So certainly the US and the Australian markets aren't really factoring in 
any interest rate cuts in the near term. If that is true, then potentially the risk of a recession is much higher, uh, certainly if you believe the, the bond market, and that even gives further weight to you know, questioning why those US stocks are so overvalued. So in summary, the US stock market and really stock markets around the world assume that inflation is going to return to normal relatively quickly, which will allow the central banks to start cutting interest rates and they'll avoid a recession. In contrast, the bond market takes the opposite stance, anticipating that inflation is going to be persistent for longer and as such, interest rates will remain at these levels, potentially pushing the US and maybe the rest of the world into a recession. Now, as I said, you need to look a little bit deeper under the performance to really understand what's going on. So we looked at uh, longer term returns in terms of the last 10 years of returns, US market has outperformed. We then found that the US market on a valuation multiple perspective looks to be overvalued, but not all stocks are overvalued. If you look at the top 10 most valuable stocks on the S&P 500 index, they make up for a quarter of the value of the total index. Now, just for your information, those top 10 stocks are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, and Google, and Facebook. Now, these top seven companies have a lot in common. They're all in technology. They're all trading at very high PE ratios. And if you have a look at the S&P's performance, excluding these top, 10, top seven companies, the S&P's performance would have been flat, as in no return. So all the return in the S&P 500 this year has been delivered by only seven companies. Those seven companies dominate the index and they're trading at very high PE ratios. Now, these stocks are considered risky in my view because the only way you're going to achieve a return by investing them uh, is if they outperform the already elevated growth and earnings expectations that the market already has for them. So it means that they need to do even better than how they've been priced. Uh, and to put that in context, for example, Tesla, in terms of how it's valued, and whilst it's not in the top seven stocks, it's in the top nine, Tesla has to essentially own the entire auto manufacturing industry. So it'd be as large as the entire industry for it to be able to deliver a return, a reasonable return to investors. And I mean, that's just not going to happen. So you have to, at some point, form a viewpoint to say these expectations, whilst this company might be great, these expectations are too lofty. However, it's important to remember not all US stocks are overvalued. So for example, mid cap and small cap are relatively cheap by historic measures. Therefore, perhaps by adopting an equal weight index rather than a traditional market cap index can help address some of these concentration risks and capitalize on valuation opportunities. So what I did is have a look at some of the indicators that use peer-reviewed models that have a reliable means of predicting future returns. Now, they're not perfect. They just have a strong correlation with predicting future returns. There's no guarantees of anything, of course, uh, but it really is the best indicator. And future stock returns are influenced really by three factors. The dividend yield that you expect to get off the stock or index the earnings growth that you expect, which is really partly demonstrated by economic and industry growth, uh, and then valuation multiples, you know, any change in valuation multiples. And really the most attractive markets based on all that analysis and data, and again, you can find this table on the blog on the website, the link is in the show notes, uh, is the Japanese market is likely to be the best performing over the next 10 years then Australia, then emerging markets, and then it's Europe excluding UK, and then UK, and so on and so forth, with US large stocks uh, delivering maybe a return with a 50% probability of around 3.7% over the next 10 years. So certainly below maybe a third of its long-term average, which again makes sense given we started this podcast by talking about the US market being one of the best performing markets over the last 10 years. It's therefore not surprising that it's most likely to be the worst performing market in the next 10 years. Now, having said all that, I don't mean for you to go turn around tomorrow and put all your money in the Japanese market because all these indicators suggest that it's going to be the best performing. 
that would be silly and not in line with a, a rules-based, evidence-based approach. What I'm suggesting is that you skew your investments towards markets that exhibit better opportunities for future returns uh, and then potentially underweight those markets that don't, uh, but also then considering consider using different strategies in different markets, so different indexing or rules-based low-cost strategies in different markets. So for example, you could use a value approach, you know, which filters out overvalued stocks, a quality factor approach, which really focuses on companies with high quality attributes, such as low de debt and strong cash flow. Uh, you can use equal weight indices. So that's going to give you greater exposure to mid cap and small cap market uh, and less exposure to those large cap stocks in that geographical market. Uh, or fundamental indexing, which uh, really minimizes unnecessary turnover just to just stock price, price fluctuations. That tends to be good in a market like the Aussie market that is really dominated by financials and miners. Uh, and so, you know, that sometimes the rhetoric of the day can tell us whether banks are popular or unpopular, and that can have a big impact on the makeup of and the turnover of an index, unnecessarily so. Uh, whereas, you know, if you own those banks, you'd probably just own them through the period of popularity and uh, periods where they're not so popular. So I guess to really sum up this podcast, I can say that constructing a portfolio that utilizes various rules-driven, evidence-based, cost-effective indexing approaches that are tailored to different geographical markets can significantly reduce investment risk, you know, by avoiding those risky areas, whilst at the same time uh, positioning your portfolio to potentially experience higher than average returns by, again, using that irrefutable law of mean reversion. Again, all the detail and charts are in the blog on the website. Uh, a link is in the show notes. And until next week, bye for now.